Oh, it is <laughs> it's so One, two, three. Okay. <clears throat> Good morning. So this is the second half of the uh, core working group uh, meeting. We had a pretty productive uh, meeting yesterday and already uh, uh, covered some of the items that were on the agenda for uh, today. Uh, so. Uh, just to uh, remind uh, people, uh, this is an IETF meeting. The IPR principles of the IETF apply, including the Note Well. Uh, and this is the original agenda uh, for uh, today. And uh, we we are going to move up. Uh, the DevUN item, because Yari is only available uh, around 10 o'clock. And uh, we already covered two items, and we have covered this one, but we have to return to it. Uh, so we will do that. Any other things we need to change in the agenda? Okay, in that case, we'll jump into Coco, Caldas. Okay, good morning, everyone. My name is Carlos Gomez, and I'm going to present the current status and the last update of the draft entitled Co-op Simple Congestion Control Advanced, also known as COCO. So first of all, let's take a look at the status of the draft. The document is currently in working group state, submitted to ISG4 publication, and the last revision is dash 03, which uh, incorporates mostly editorial updates and addresses comments by Wesley Eddy as the TSVR early review, and Miria Kulowin, who's the responsible lady for this document. And by the way, both reviewers have expressed that uh, the last revision of the document satisfies their comments. And then for the next revision, we need to address the comments by four additional reviewers. Uh, that is uh, the reviews from Scott Bradner, Vincent Roca and Krista Holmberg. And in addition, there was uh, an, an additional set of comments received yesterday by uh, Gauri. So we need to address uh, all these additional comments. Uh, later today uh, in the presentation, I'll refer to how we plan or which is our position uh, related with a comment by Scott Bradner. However, the other three reviews have been received just a few days ago or even a few hours ago. So uh, uh, for those we don't have slides, we're still processing the comments. Okay, so let's go quickly through the updates in dash 03. The first update is in section one introduction. So now we have added a new paragraph there, which in its original form was uh, previously in section five, which is the section that focuses on nuns. And now it has been adapted, made a bit more general, and it provides an overview on what COCO does. Uh, we explained that uh, COCO computes the RTO based on weak or strong RTTs, because we use weak RTTs uh, in addition to strong RTTs, the reaction of COCO to congestion is by using a low ascending rate, and uh, specifically for nuns, the ascending rate is limited to one message per RTO, per destination endpoint, which is uh, more conservative if everything works as expected than what is stated in RFC 7641, which would define a limit of one message per RTT per destination endpoint. Then in section three, we have added details on the scenarios where COCO has been found to perform well. Uh, we explained that these scenarios uh, comprise latencies that range from milliseconds to up to peaks of uh, dozens of seconds. There's an additional comment by Jaime, uh, which is that we, we might need to detail a bit more which reference contributes to what within this range. Also, scenarios used in evaluations comprise single hop and multi-hop network topologies and uh, link technologies that 
have been used in evaluations comprise 15.4, GPRS, UMTS, and Wi-Fi. Also, we've added that COCO is expected to work suitably across the general internet, so not only within the limits of a constrained node network. Then, in section 4.2, which is the one that uh, defines the algorithm for the RTO, we have added an explanation for the default weight values used for the strong and weak RTO estimators. Basically, we have found that these work well in evaluations that are referenced in Appendix A of the document. And also in 4.2.1, we've added an explicit note on the fact that the variable backoff factor used in COCO replaces the simple exponential backoff that has been traditionally used in TCP and also in, in default co-op. Then in section 4.3, we explain that the state of RTO estimators for an endpoint should be kept uh, long enough. And now we provide the motivation for this. The idea is we want to avoid frequent returns to inappropriate initial values of the algorithm. And also we write that for the fault parameters in co-op, it is recommended to keep such state for at least 255 seconds. So, uh, well, this was a must not a recommendation in 02. So this is possibly the only technical update in, in 03. And also now we make explicit the relationship between this time, uh, at least 255 seconds, and the parameters of co-op that are in use, uh, especially in particular those that are relevant are those in section 4.8 of RFC 7252. And it is anyway this time uh, the time during which we need to keep the state for the RTO estimator and needs to scale with those parameters. And also we have uh, made a number of minor editorial updates throughout the document. So for the next revision, um, we have uh, several comments as uh, mentioned before. So on Scott Brandner's comment, uh, he has only one comment, which is that the draft makes no reference to RFC 5033, which is a document that provides guidelines for specifying new congestion control algorithms for the internet. However, we can argue that we have actually taken into account such guidance when designing COCO. And this slide and the next one uh, show which are the different guidelines in 5033 and which is our position on that. Carlos, before you go into the details on that, <clears throat> uh, maybe we can use of, of the adult supervision that uh, uh, the transport area has provided for us today. Uh, Gary Fairhurst is here. And uh, may maybe you can make a quick comment on the microphone on, on how you think 5033 should influence what we are doing. Sorry for <laughs> surprising you with this. Yeah. <laughs> Might have to switch it on. The other microphone was not switched on either. <coughs> Hi, I'm Gory first. Aha, that's good. I amplified. Okay, so I'm um, I'm coming at this just parachuting into the room. So. Um, my initial response was just to provide some comments as I read through it. On the 5033, I, I think this guidance is mainly meant for transport protocols like the ones that are listed, TCP, SCTP, DCCP, presumably QUIC, and other transport protocols. The transport I see here looks a bit more like what's described in RSC 8085. In other words, it's a timer-based lockstep retransmission method, so maybe some of these checklists do not apply, and you could say this, but um, point number one does apply. You, you still shouldn't impact standard transports. So if there's anything that happens here that could appear on the internet and could stop TCP behaving in the way it normally does, then I think you have to consider that. So I think you probably need some sentence that addresses this, but I'm not sure all of 5033 applies. Thank you. Shall I maybe just uh, proceed with the just list? quickly go through them, I yeah. think. So, uh, well, in, in 5033, there are nine guidelines, 
and you can see uh, for each one of them we have the lowest level bullet which indicates our position and how coco or the design of coco has uh, taken them into consideration so uh, the first is about uh, deviations from congestion control principles in 2914 need to be motivated however we believe uh, we have uh, our coco design is aligned with those uh, congestion control principles uh, then for guideline one we believe coco has no negative impact on existing protocols such as tcp although we may want to to discuss something later with a second presentation in this lot then uh, coco has been designed for difficult environments in terms of what 5033 defines for this term then also a range of environments have been evaluated as has been shown before also we believe coco protects against congestion collapse because of the uh, values used for the variable back of factor when retries are needed we have evaluated fairness of the new congestion control uh, mechanism and we have found it is high especially thanks to how the, the variable backup factor compensates some possible potential issues in terms of fairness in some topologies. Then uh, we have considered a situation where there might be performance issues with misbehaving nodes. We have text on that in the security consideration section. Uh, and in that case, uh, when nodes may want to drop packets to decrease performance, we explain that the weak estimator may help uh, recovering from such situation. Also, we've evaluated situations like uh, in guideline seven, uh, where there is some sudden event, for example, a number of sensors that many of them detect some event at the same time and want to communicate such detection leading to temporary congestion. And we found that COCO uh, helps restoring normal network state quickly. And uh, the last guideline is about incremental deployment. And we believe that COCO runs correctly in current constrained node network scenarios and also in scenarios where a constrained node communicates with a not so constrained device possibly as cloud infrastructure for example okay so that's all from my side any additional <coughs> comments or questions Okay, so if, if um, there, there are no further comments on this, we have some some new results that, that uh, Marco uh, Coyo is going to um, present. Um, so please go ahead. Okay, do you hear me? Good. Oh, so uh, this is uh, joint work with my team, uh, Ilpo, Ivo, and Laura, uh, together with uh, Carl Chen. Uh, so the system under study that we are using is uh, uh, we use a varying number of IoT devices to increase the load, so the so congestion in the first place, and we run over a constraint bottleneck link, so downlink 30 kilobits per second, uplink 60 kilobits per second, round trip time, a little bit, little bit over <coughs> 600 milliseconds. Um, uh, so this kind of uh, emulates an uh, NB IoT like environment but we don't say that this in the iot environment so good enough to, to see the, uh, the the effects and uh, from the router to the uh, fixed host uh, we have a random delay between <coughs> 100 and uh, sorry 10 and 20 uh, milliseconds and this is the fast link so so it's not kind of a, uh, affecting the uh, so the any, uh, affecting the uh, traffic in any other way uh, <clears throat> on the uh, router, we have varying buffer size. Use varying buffer sizes to recommend the PDB size two thousand five hundred bytes, kind of a small buffer, and then increasing sizes for, for the buffers. And the, the, uh, the, then we have the, as we call it, infinite buffer. So it's not, of course, infinite, but it's large enough so that there there will be no packet losses with the uh, load that we give. Uh, we implemented the client and server using libcorp so or actually for the default corp so so the uh, 7252 implementation we used the uh, as as it was implemented in there we added some some bug fixes but that's all uh coco was implemented with the uh, trust version 
uh, O1 as well as the uh, O3, uh, because we noticed that there was a change in the uh, variable back of factor from one, uh, one zero one to, to zero two. So we wanted to experiment with that as well. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, for the default carbon cocoa, we modify the max retransmit to 20. This is just to see that there are no aborts for, for any of the exchanges. So the max retransmit of 4 is defined. This is just to make the, sure that our tests run with all the way to the end and we get the, uh, the results that are kind of a comparable. Uh, 32 seconds for cocoa was specified as, as a as specified was used for the max RTO. For the default cop, we, we use 60 seconds, so because otherwise in some cases the, uh, the RTO fires very high. And it's it's kind of a, they, those <coughs> tests would take a very long time. Uh, we implemented corporate TCP as per draft uh, 09, and, <coughs> and it includes only the necessary feature, features kind of to run the tests. And we use the Linux TCP, but we modified that so that we don't use any of the fancy features. So we use just new Reno, so we disable SAC, Cubic timestamps, FRTO, all, all these experimental features, TCP rack, and so on. Uh, modified the delay act time to be constant, 200 milliseconds. And then we also, for the, uh, the retry counts for TCP, we, we, we modified them to high enough so that the, uh, none of the TCP connections won't apport. Okay, for the workload, we use uh, small request reply, uh, request response exchanges uh, so that they fit into a single co-op message. Uh, and then we increase the load by using one client all the way up to 400 clients. So this gives the kind of a increasing trend in the uh, offered load. And at the same time, of course, the congestion. So we put the, put the system in a real stress with the, uh, this higher number of, the, uh, of clients or client server pairs. And we use two types of uh, workloads, uh, continuous clients, where those clients, they exchange 50 request response exchanges. Uh, and for TCP, the TCP connection is uh, pre-established, so the three-way handshake doesn't affect the measurement, so we can compare the, uh, the, the TCP with the uh, the other two, so the default co-op and, and co-op. Then we have the random clients, which emulate short-lived clients. So there, each short-lived random client exchanges random number from one to ten uh, message exchanges, and then a new <coughs> client starts immediately and exchanges yet another one to ten until fifty exchanges are completed. So the so this is kind of a, we can compare the results with the random and the continuous client in, in this sense. The difference, of course, being there that now, now the system is putting, or the, those clients are putting the more test because the retransmission times are reinitized for each random client. And the same for the TCP, the TCP connection is, is uh, or, or the new TCP connection is open for each new random client. Okay, to the test results. So here we have the results for one and 10 clients. So this is just providing the baseline, so the flow completion time, so how long it does take to, to complete these 50 exchanges. It takes something like roughly 33 seconds in all cases, except with the co-op or TCP, with the random clients where, of course, because TCP needs to kind of establish a new connection every now and then that that gives the, uh, the overhead there. So those TCP <coughs> uh, completion times are over 40 seconds. And then if you look at the 50 clients case, now the uh, full completion times increase to about 60 seconds. And this is mostly because of the queuing delay. So here we have more load, but still not quite congesting the link, with the exception that the TCP, which has a, a larger header, it means that the uh, less TCP packets fit into the router buffer, so the TCP has a little bit more losses compared to the uh, default co-op and co-op, which has just a few few losses in there. And that shows in the uh, left-hand side to continue, with the continuous clients, the TCP has a little bit higher flow completion time. And then, of course, on the right-hand side, because of the new TCP connections are created, those 
there is this clear difference there, of course. Okay, then uh, 100 clients, and now something starts to happen. If you look at the, uh, <coughs> the uh, uh, what, what now happens is that when we increase the close, now, now the system becomes congested, and with the infinite buffer, or when, when we increase the size of the buffer, of course, more queuing delay occurs. And now, because of the queuing delay, the RTD uh, <coughs> is increased over 2.5 seconds. This means that now, when we are using the initial RTO of with, with default Guava and Cocoa from, from 2 to 3 seconds, now this initial <coughs> retransmission down. Uh, re retransmission timeout starts to happen. And COCOA and, and TCP, they handle this just fine because they adjust the timer. So in the early stages, they, they need to retransmit a few times, but then they adjust the timer and, 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 and everything is fine. But with the default COP, it each time when it retransmits, it back, backs off, which is fine. So that's what it, what it needs to do. But then for the next exchange, it, it restores the initial timeout and does it again, retransmits and again and again. And if you look at the number of retransmissions, we will see that for 50 exchanges, it needs basically retransmit every, <coughs> every, every uh, request once. So it does the double the work. And now this is the first sign of the congestion collapse. So, so there is no kind of a fine line when we have a congestion collapse. The congestion collapse is basically defined that the, uh, if we increase the load and the useful work of the system then decreases, then we have signs of the congestion collapse. And that's what we will see with the default code when we further increase the, the load. So with the 200 clients, if you look at the infinite buffers, what happens there? That happens with the uh, <coughs> with the default cop. It gets slower and slower. But if you look at the small buffer on the left hand side, both both with the uh, uh, it, with the continuous clients, there we can see that the uh, with the flow complete sometimes there is some difference between TCP and and uh, and default cop and cocoa. So basically, they are pretty much the same, but but there is much more variation with TCP, and this is because TCP does the full TCP compatible back off. It means that some of the clients they wait for longer, they back off for, for longer time, while the others can proceed. And and but but the, this is different from what happens with the default crop because they both Cocoa and default <coughs> crop they have the same problem that they restore. For the next exchange, the uh, the retransmission time. If you look at the, uh, the 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 number of retransmissions, there is a clear difference with TCP. So, so to the small buffer, 2,500 <coughs> bytes with with the, with the circled the TCP, and then the uh, default co-op and co -op. This means that now this is not visible in the whole completion time because all these unnecessary retransmissions or sorry, two aggressive retransmissions that default Guam and Coco do, they are dropped in the in the router. So they so then they kind of are so called <coughs> undelivered retransmissions, which is a second type of a sign of the congestion collapse. Because these undelivered retransmissions they affect the network before the bottleneck. And if we have too much of those, then we may have a congestion collapse somewhere else. Okay, and now if we increase then the uh, the blow to the uh, 400 clients, that is the ties that we were offering, we will see that the default cop, of course, has the uh, still has the problem. But interestingly, what happens now is that the uh, that the uh, cocoa also starts to collapse with the uh, continuous clients, not as badly as the default cop, and with the random clients on the right hand side, cocoa collapses as well. And what is more interesting is that the, the version 03 is worse than the uh, than the uh, 01. And why this happens? If you look at the uh, number of free transmissions, this shows up there. If you look at the left hand side first, the continuous clients with the infinite buffer, there we have a see that that the uh, 
those uh, Cocoa version 3 has much, much more retransmissions than the version 1. And the, uh, but not that much as, as the uh, uh, default crop has. And what happens there is that with more than a half of the clients, they are not able to adjust their timer because now the round trip time is so high that, that during the first round trips, they are not even able to get the, uh, the weak sample. And why they don't get the weak sample with the O3, but to get with the O01 is the is that, that the back, the variable back of factor was changed. The original definition was that, that we look at the RTO estimate and compare whether it is about three seconds. <clears throat> then, we, then we use the back of factor 0.5. And if it's below three seconds, we use the binary exponential. And now what happens there for those clients that get the, the, uh, the, the sample and are able to adjust the, the timers, <clears throat> they practically use for the first retransmission, they double the timer, but for the next one, they don't anymore. While with it in the uh, O1, they continue with the initial timer using the uh, doubling, so which is more conservative. This is one difference. And then there is another difference, and this relates to the aging. So aging is defined that if there is no update to the timer uh, for four times the current RTO value, then we age. And it is defined that if the RTO value is over three seconds, as, as here it is, then we take the, the timer, the, the, the retransmission timeout value down towards the initial values, which is exactly the wrong thing here because now our delay is increasing, we should be kind of increasing the value, not decreasing the value. And then the third thing that affects the uh, is that the cocoa is that the uh, it has the upper bound of 32 seconds for the uh, for the uh, timer. And in this case, actually, especially when we are backing off, our timer should be go beyond even beyond 32 seconds. All right. So these are the uh, uh, our results, and it seems to me that the, uh, the protocol actions are needed. So with the uh, 7252, the, uh, because we don't employ, uh, employ full backoff that is TCP compatible. So it means that we are restoring the, uh, the, the two seconds initial RTO for the next exchange. This is the pro basic problem with the default crop. So the COCOA has the same problem uh, with the difference, of course, that it is not restoring the initial RTO value, but the current RTO estimate. And the current RTO estimate, in some cases, not not enough, as we as, as we saw. And with the RTO estimate larger than three, we are kind of applying this aging blindly. We decrease the RTO, so as we saw in some cases, this is not a good thing. It is kind of justified there in the in the in the cocoa. <coughs> Draft that that in idle period, after idle periods is a good thing. It might be a good thing, but not always. So so this this calls for an update as well. And then also this uh, upper point of 32 seconds for RTO. This is actually in conflict with the uh, draft uh, IETF TCP uh, RTO considerations. So these are general considerations for the uh, for the uh, timer mechanism that that we should use in the uh, internet. So the action sports, I, I think what we need is to, to edit the uh, cocoa draft. That, that should be easy because we can address it. And But then for the uh, 7252, we need, need an, seems, seems that we are needing an update. So we could write a short ID that updates. That should be easy thing to do. It's not, it's just a couple of pages maybe. And uh, for the cocoa, then uh, we should reconsider this aging at the RTO values larger than three, and as well as we should reconsider this upper bound of 32 seconds, which actually now after the change in the uh, in the uh, version 03, it doesn't apply in any other case anymore, except when the RTO value is uh, about seven seconds, roughly about seven seconds. We never reach the 32 with the max retransmit of four. Okay, 
Thank you. So can, can you go back to the slide with the meat on it? Which one? Previous slide? Previous. Okay. So just pro tip, never put a thank you Q&A slide at the end of your presentation because that's not what we are discussing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, I would like to make several points here. Uh, one about default co-op, which I think we, we should lay to rest uh, quickly. Um, of course, we know that there is no state kept there in, in co-op. Um, but if you, if you think this change needs to be made, you will have to make it for TCP too, because TCP has exactly the same problem that when you- TCP, start, you said. TCP. No, this DCP, DCP backs, backs off, and then it doesn't restore the RTO value, but it keeps the exponential impact of value until you get an acknowledgement without retransmissions. So when you send a new, new segment and get an acknowledgement for that without retransmission, only after that, this is this is uh, 6298. If I open, it's not if I open a new TCP connection, mm -hmm. I get new state, right? And that's exactly what happens with CoAP here. So we all we all have experienced the congestion collapse that you get when the network is not even fast enough uh, to open the TCP connection. Because TCP has exactly the same prob uh, property no, here. No, you don't, because 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 we we, we see here this for the random clients TCP is open and new TCP comes every now and then. What happens that that you retransmit your SYN, you have a timer, right? Yes. And then if the delay is too much, then then you you retransmit with with the backup factor. And yes. After a while, you get the the, the, the SYNAC, right? And then for the next segment, you keep but, this. Higher and, and, you, never, and you won't retransmit you, anymore. You never get there when you experience the condition if, if collapse you, I just uh, described. You will get it if you retransmit long enough, it, meaning that, that your retries are not lo too low. And and today what the TCP uses as a default is, is, is high enough for, I would say, almost all foreseen kind of environments. You, you <coughs> so you, you're comparing the case where TCP keeps state for the connection. Mm -hmm. And CoAP, of course, does not keep state it, it because keeps, they it, are, these are independent exchanges. You mean the default CoAP is not keeping any state? Right. So, But that's, the, prob that's the problem. No, yeah, yes, and Cocoa is the fix for that. Yeah, okay, then, 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 then if, if we are not keeping any state, then the initial RT of two seconds is way too low. For your specific experiment setup, yes. No, in general, that that's also there in in the in the UDP guidelines. It says at least three seconds. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So yeah, between two and a half and three yeah. seconds. Yeah. The, the, but okay. That's the difference. I I, I understand that that with, with some of the constraint devices, you do not necessarily you are not able to keep the state. But that's not the whole story. What what we should say there in 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 the in in the uh, spec is that if you if it's possible, you should keep the state. And and for, for most devices, or at least a large number of devices, this should be okay today. So the, the recommendation it, it, that that uh, we should because, be because, making sorry. is is the recommendation that we should be making is if you can keep the state, do cocoa. Okay, fine. Yeah, I think and, that, and, that and is in, in a that cocoa, is, and in a cocoa you should do the same as the TCP does, and currently it does not do that. Right. I, I just wanted to lay the rest, lay to rest the, the the suggestion that we have to change seven two fifty two because I, I don't think we have to. And, and I think what we what we need to do we need to reconsider at least what is the initial RTO value which is given now as a two seconds. That should be well. It's, it's between two and three seconds. It's randomly. between two and three, but still below three. Yes. On the average, two point five. Yes. Yeah. I'm. I'm not sure that is going to break the internet. Um, with respect to to Coco, um, I think there are a number of of really useful observations here. Um, one thing is the the thirty two seconds that is the upper bound for the RTO in in Coco really is based on the default parameters. 
So if you have a, a max retransmit of five, uh, this is exactly what you should use as your, your upper bound. While if you have a much larger max retransmit, then you also should uh, change your upper bound. And that's something that, that uh, we definitely missed uh, when, when defining co uh, Coco. So this, this should be a tunable that depends on uh, max retransmit. So that, that's one uh, important observation uh, here. The yeah, other but, one but, but, but even with the current parameters, the, the, if you have four retransmissions, it goes above 32 seconds. If, you're in, if, if your RTO estimate value is more than seven seconds, and in, in the O O O one version, it happens also with with, with two seconds. Initial uh, RTO value. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, so maybe the, the 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 function that that we uh, need to define for the the that is based on on max retransmit won't yield exactly thirty two for even for the current value of current default value of max retransmit. So let, let, let's discuss that. I think that that's yeah. one point we, we can take home. Um, the other one is the aging. The, the point is that the, the number 32 should depend on max retransmit and that maybe the number 32 also isn't right for the default value of max retransmit. So so sorry, could you? I didn't follow what you mean. Could you repeat? The, <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, so uh, the observation is that uh, the number 32 as the upper bound for the RTO mm -hmm. should uh, depend on max retransmit. And that also maybe the, the value 32 for the, the default value of max retransmit is not sufficient. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the, the other thing is the aging issue. And I think that that's really uh, interesting <coughs> because your, your simulation is uh, um, based on a situation where you essentially have uh, continuous conditions for, for the whole time of, of the uh, simulation. Mm -hmm. Now, aging was not designed to handle continuous conditions, but it was designed to handle bursts. So if we have a, a burst in the network, uh, we want to go back to a relatively normal um, uh, situation quickly. And that, that the, the problem with not having aging uh, is that random losses uh, make your, your reaction uh, to, can make your reaction time very high uh, when uh, you don't have some form of, of aging. Um, so I think fundamentally the, the idea of aging is uh, right. And uh, from a deployment uh, perspective, nobody in their right mind would uh, deploy Coco if we didn't have aging because it, uh, some random losses for, for a, a quick burst uh, would uh, uh, turn your implementation into a very sluggish uh, one. So we have to have some form of aging. Now the, the yeah, yeah, I understand the basis for that, but, but the, the, the message is that, that in some settings, like with the high delay, it's, it's, it, it provides the wrong result because, because if you have more than two retransmits, it is currently that aging comes into the play and decreases the, the, the uh, <clears throat> RTO value. And in some cases, if your deterring value is more closer to three seconds, what happens is that, that, that your timer ages before you get the, uh, the weak sample. So with the second retransfer, that is also a portion that happens in our tests as well. And this is not a good thing that you first age the value and then you get the sample and you, you, you recalculate with this aged value. Okay, so I think we, we have an interesting misunderstanding here. Aging is, is supposed to be used when you are idle. Yes, that was for our understanding with, with O1 version and that's why we, we first didn't even implement aging, then we implemented. But with O3, it has two examples for the aging. The example, especially for the below, one second case, 
exactly shows that that during you are you are retransmitting it it kind of a takes the uh, takes it takes it up and it doesn't mention anything that that it, it, it is should be used only when you are idle when, when about three seconds so this it should be clarified at least in this case oh that, 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 that so we fixed. implemented exactly what yeah. the, what the draft says <laughs> so the, doing the the aging algorithm while you are still retransmitting that that is that will lead to problems i agree with that yeah. so we have to clarify that yeah but, but, but with the idle, idle, idle case also i think four times rto or the high values that that probably is too short period because if you think about that that your current uh rto value whatever your network setup is is your rto value is about three seconds such likely about three seconds it means that that you will age it in 12 seconds or a bit more than 12 seconds right and now it might be that your uh exchanges are started that that they happen every 15 seconds and if you get congested you have a persistent congestion just because of these features of the default co-op it doesn't necessarily go away within 15 seconds so it is not necessarily a good idea to age the value in, in such a case even though i i admit that in, in in a wireless case where you have wireless lossy this is the hard problem because we, we don't yes. we, we have had this same problem with tcp and there is no solution and the best solution there is is, is to try to get the uh, the, the 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 samples as as often as, as as you can and in that sense kind of a v v example is a maybe a good idea but the problem is there that that you use the you have to use these ambitious uh <clears throat> samples with retransmissions which actually give you a very high value it, it's better than nothing but the uh, it's still problematic here but the problem is hard yeah i, I agree that this is hard yeah. and uh, so um, one thing that, that when we discussed this was uh, aging maybe should be more tunable, but of course that just throws over the problem in, into the court of, of the poor guy who has to configure <laughs> the thing, and we know how well that works. Um, but so, one, one, sorry if I say that the one thing that is important. So we, we, we have this performance problem with, with the wireless for sure, yes, but the congestion is the thing that we need to deal first. We need we, we need to ensure that we are safe on that side and then we can do whatever modifications with the uh, to, to 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 handle the, uh, the the wireless losses better that is kind of the basic guideline that we should have there right but we also have to have a protocol that's actually deployable um so the, um we we have too little information that's the whole problem and we, we are trying to run an estimator that that does something reasonably uh, useful, and we know we we in a network that just doesn't give you replies, you don't don't get enough information to to actually uh, always uh, react in a sensible way. Um, so again, I think what we we need to take home here is that first of all, uh, it needs to be made very clear that aging is only used in in idle uh, periods. And I, I would be interesting, uh, interested to see your numbers when you actually implement it that way. Do you think your O1 numbers are representative of that? Or sorry, is, sorry. Is, so if, if, if you, you implement aging the way that, that the authors intended, which is that aging only applies when, when you are idle. So that is pretty much the results that where we implemented O1. Or one without aging. Okay. So so it still has this this problem with the with, with the random clients and, and the high high enough load. So it is has this con but it, but the ma major cause for this is, is this this the uh not retaining the uh fact of RTO value. That is the main cause. That if we fix that then 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 I think this aging and the uh and this upper bound of, of thirty two seconds they 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 have a role there, but 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 we we mostly fix everything if we we, we do that. And then we need to reconsider whether whether some other modification and, and what actual is what of those are needed. Because that is the major major cause. Right. We, so what we, what we saw there is this that, that that just this because of aging, like we need now implemented it, it uh it kind of takes these problems or these, these problems of you just 
little bit earlier. But finally, they yeah. occur just because of if we don't retain this fact of RT about this is the main 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 reason for the problems. Yeah, and I think we have to look in exactly into why that is not happening in in your situation because the 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 current RTO estimate uh, contains back of information and and maybe we have to look into this a little bit more in detail but we probably can't do this at the microphone uh right now um yeah but thank you this, this was really useful uh, work and i think it, it uh, clearly shows um that there are limits uh of the default curb um, uh, congestion control and there are uh, also limits where the parameter set that uh, we have defined for, for Coco works well and uh, we probably want to update it based based on that information. You are one of the others. So, so one thing that wasn't on the slides but is interesting and related to this congestion collapse that actually even for this 400 uh, clients uh, the actual RTT is on is something like uh, 10 to uh, 15 seconds depending on whether you have continuous or random clients so it's still clearly below this uh, even this uh, 32 seconds if the congestion control would work uh, well enough so that it would prevent this collapse but now now as the uh, congestion uh, control causes the uh, collapse to happen the actual art uh, RTT rises rises much higher, so you have these unnecessary transmissions which consume yeah. some of the capacity. But not only that, they also increase the RTT much much beyond what it could be. So so if you have just one one uh, request reply per client, which is not always possible with random clients because there is the state is occasionally lost. But but for continuous client, you can always have this that you have just one one uh, uh, request reply there and with that that uh, even with 400 clients it's slightly more than 10 seconds the actual rtt so if, if if we can prevent the collapse the rtt also will will be much lower lower so so this max rto is not so significant any anymore so so this case is not sort of Pushing, pushing the load beyond the 32 seconds, but because of the collapse, the RTT goes that high. Yes, every 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 uh, request was retransmitted at least four times, which means that the useful work that the system was doing was less than 10, 20 percent of the, uh, the capacity. Can you go back to the 400? It's not working anymore. So page, it's not working anymore. I can't call. <laughs> it's not working. Oh, no, okay, now. So which one? Um, so you, you do have numbers for Coco version 01 there, mm -hmm. uh, which I think are uh, implementing the, the uh, aging closer to what we actually had in mind, what V3 means. No, the aging, aging actually is implemented the same in in both cases so this this uh, cocoa without aging it is just then it does simply doesn't do the aging. so in in that in that sense in these experiments it is equal to the case that if you apply aging only with idle periods okay so it never happens but as we can see with the random clients with infinite buffer the uh, the results are the same so we still have this uh, every segment is uh, every uh, request is free transmitted at least uh, four times or more or less four times so so on only 20 percent useful work that the system does there and if you increase the the load further to the 800 clients then this is, this is also kind of a more or less double this is uh, so then then only 10 percent and finally there will be very little forward progress or or useful work in the system Okay, so the, the, the anomaly in the left graph would be fixed by by making more clear in the document that aging is only uh, to be used in the idle period. And on the right side, we, we still have a problem. 
if we if we keep the pact of value for the next request, then then the problem should go more or less away. Okay, so let's and, 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 and with the default curve, we are not able to do that. If I understood it, yeah. Um, but but after all, it is only one. It's only only one variable. So I, I would say that many systems can afford it. <laughs> so so I, I think we should recommend a little bit more than what you said, kind of. But you don't necessarily need to do uh, implement cocoa, but but you can add one variable. So what, to keep yes, the time, to keep, keep the timer value. Then you also have to add a decaying mechanism. There. Uh, no, no, you don't need to have a decay mechanism. Well, no, I the, think the, the you do. doesn't have that. You you want to say uh, stay at the safe side. That's that's all all you need. Well, again, TCP starts at three again. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, let's let's not go into this discussion. But <laughs> yes. yeah, I know. But but we need to be safe with the congestion first, and then then to think about the wireless losses. After all, we we have okay. Unfortunately, the time doesn't allow. We we have results for the uh, the wireless case as well. So comparing this, there there is no dramatic there. There are such differences between the cases. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we we, we intend to uh, publish this shortly. But yeah. Don't have this here right now. For thank you. Yeah. Carlos Gomez. Um, so uh, I was wondering just a couple of minor details. And um, by the way, thanks for all this work. It's really helpful. Um, is it possible that when you mention zero one, it is not right draft IETF core Coco zero one, but instead it's draft Borman. No, no, it, it's it's the, uh, and the working group draft. And yes, because I, I think you mentioned that the we, impl we implement it right. We just we're completing the implementation when the when the O2 uh, draft came out. So that's why we implemented that one. And then we later implemented the O3, which which doesn't ha have any changes, technical changes in that sense. So it's uh, same as O2. Yeah. So. <laughs> Zero, the difference between zero one and zero three. Uh, yeah, so the the variable back, the only notable change there is this this change how the, the variable back of factor is kind of a treated. Okay, may, may need to double check because I, I think there was not a change in the variable. There was change. Okay. There was clear change. May, maybe not intended, but there was. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> then we need to, to double check what is intended. Yeah. And then just I'm, I'm curious why the, the setting for max retransmit of twenty. Just because otherwise, okay, we can take a look, big look at. Which one do you want? Do back up. Towards the end. Towards the end? Yeah. This one? More, more. Yeah. Ah, okay. So here we have the uh, the results for with the frequency of transmission, saying that how many retransmissions each of the exchanges that we did needed. So zero meaning that that no retransmissions, one 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 retransmission, so on. So here we can see if you used max retransmission four, whatever is there on the right hand side. In those cases, the uh, that client would fail because the because because this uh, <clears throat> this exchange would be aborted, and we won't get the result for that. And in that sense, kind of a, for that client, the results would not be comparable with the others. That so, so just to make them comparable, we had this. And as we can see, there, there is there are some retransmissions beyond four <coughs> re, uh, re, uh, four retransmissions, which is something less than. In all cases, less than five percent of the cases. So this is also a question that the, uh, we could raise: that that if the max free transmit of four is of the best value, whether it should be a little bit higher, or alternatively, should we kind of actually use the back off factor such that it depends on the maximum retransmits? If the the lower number of free transmits we allow. Then we should use kind of a, a higher back of factor to ensure that we can get all the trans kind of a, uh, get 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 rid of the uh, the, the 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 congestion during the uh, the period that that we have available. But yeah, uh, this is just a, 
another discussion, maybe not not something to discuss right now here. Yeah, but Erwin, so so if if we would have not changed it much, lead transit, we would have this offered load has would have varied depending on how many of those clients fail fail. So because of that, we couldn't have compared to, those cases so well because these these are sort of random effects. One, one of the clients might 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 do more more of the back offs than some some other. So so the number of uh, uh, clients who, which are able to complete successfully what would have worried if we would have not increased this much retransmit. So this is just to make the uh, test test uh, uh, to be useful. Useful, of course, it would be possible to run run with this much retransmit for 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 and then some some of them fail, but then then you have this issue that that. Uh, the offered load would have not been the same between different congestion controls, so so it's harder to then then compare the uh, flow completion times and whatever. Well, I I think I understand this reason, but uh, anyway, I think it might also be interesting to to run the evaluations also for max uh, retransmits at four. Um, it, it, it wouldn't change the, the final outcome because this is just a setup that we, we are running to a certain number of clients and, and, and these 50 exchanges. We could have the exactly the same load with with larger number of, of, uh, of clients that are maybe exchanging every 10 seconds or whatever. It's just, just a, depends on what is the, the no, amount of offered load, so how many clients you have, you, have, you will have exactly the same result. It doesn't matter kind of in that sense. Yeah, so uh, well, we, we have about three minutes left for, for the topic. So, Gori, if you want to give your impression. Gori, first, I'd, I'd just like to kind of come back at the end. And first of all, I found that discussion really, really helpful. And when I pointed to Scott Bradner's documents and I talked about TCP, I'm talking about flow, TCP flows. You shouldn't directly compare one TCP SYN with one other packet. So you need to talk about it in this way, talk about the effect of congestion claps in the network. So congestion claps is more important, I think, than performance for the network. In doing that, I have some concerns which I think you should look at, which is the, this idle time. I don't think you can reset RTT without really seriously considering that in the presence of failures. So I think we talked about that, but I, I think that has to be talked about more. Either it has to be really discussed in the draft or you have to address the issue. And if you then expand the back off appropriately, I think you can have a document that actually satisfies the congestion collapse conditions. So please continue to work. Please think on this topic because I think most of the documents are okay, but this particular bit does need more work. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Since you have a bit of time, it's not quite three minutes. One minute, yes. <laughs> Good. Zach Shelby from ARM. Um, Matthias and I did some work years ago on co-op at scale. And one thing that concerns me is that are we, do, do we have the right use case in mind here when we're doing the measurements and research around um, the scenario we're worried about? and what? I see happening in the industry right now is co-ops being used in quite a centralized way. Yes, we have some kind of local communication and gateway things over wireless happening, but actually we have very large cloud providers and operators collecting data from hundreds of thousands and now scaling into millions of devices into centralized cloud platforms. So this is big data, data collection in practice. Have you guys in your in your simulation work looking at congestion control looked at that kind of scenario? One server communicating with very large numbers of low performance, you know, low bandwidth devices, but there's just lots of them, right? Uh, no, so basically, yes and no, but the uh, <clears throat> now it depends on where your bottleneck is. So how your server or your backend 
communicates with all these devices. So what is the, is how many parts there are, how many routers there are. All what matters is, is the bottleneck, where the bottleneck is and what is the offered load over that particular bottleneck. And that's what we are emulating here. We can, for the consistent control point of view, we can kind of uh, make the system <coughs> more simpler to test how the consistent control actually works, just to have the bottleneck, or in some cases, more than one bottleneck. And then, then you offer the certain amount of load there, and that's it. Simple as that. Okay, I think I think for that we probably need to do a little brainstorming with um, some of the operators in the room, some of the LP WAN providers, like where these bottlenecks might be showing up, um, and where we might have fairness problems with TCP traffic. Um, like, but I can't answer that off the top of my head. What? Where those might be, but just to make sure that what we're doing here is real, from from an industry perspective. Thank you. So <clears throat> we um, essentially consumed most of the Slack time we have uh, we had uh, gained uh, on on Monday. So the next one on the agenda is uh, Yari with the UN. Okay, so I'm here to give a short update on, on this draft um, and also have a couple of requests and, and uh, questions for you guys to um, try and answer. So, I mean, just to set the stage in, in case you haven't been in the room before when this has been discussed, the, um, the dev URNs are our namespace for hardware device identifiers. Um, we support MAC addresses, EUI64 addresses, uh, one wire addresses and also sort of a free form uh, organizational um, device identifiers if, if anybody has those. At the bottom, there's one example, your dev Mac, something, something. Pretty simple. Um, and just before the deadline, I posted uh, a zero, 00 for the working group version of this, this draft. And then uh, earlier this week, published the zero 01 version. Um, the zero zero basically was just a copy of the old uh, draft, but but uh, some typo was fixed in the in the ABNF, and and then zero one uh, actually updated the uh, a URN registration template because they've updated that to, or there's a new RC uh, RC eighty one forty one I think um, it says what how to register URNs um, from now on or from that point onwards, and uh, we've updated that. Um, and uh, that, that's a textually fairly large change and also had to a answer more questions than, than I had uh, answered before. And that's, that's usually a, a good thing that, that you, I mean, the, the new template actually forces you to think through more cases than, than the, the old one. So we'll see um, some of the findings actually there. So um, I have a couple of requests and questions. One is that can people read the new template? It just appeared on Monday. Um, so would appreciate feedback. It's new text, so take a look at that. Um, and also, given that there was uh, a few more questions to answer, there were some that I didn't actually know how to answer. Uh, and one of them is that uh, the, uh, the new template asks us to specify how the particular URN type deals with uh, Q, R, or F components in uh, URN, URNs. Um, and I wasn't really sure about this. Um, so for the moment, I just wrote that they're not used. I'm not quite sure if that's the right answer, but would appreciate feedback on that. Um, so, so that's sort of the basic of, of this, this URN type. And there's two classes of, or two items of another type um, that I'm, or, or we're w wondering about, um, and those relate to possibly adding new new branches under under the dev URN. Um, so the first one is something that we had discussed briefly in in previous ITF, I think, um, adding device ID specified in uh, one M2M and uh, lightweight M2M groups. Um, and and I, I think we just basically agreed that that would be a sensible thing to do. If, if that's what, what you still think, then that's great. Um, but since I'm not personally working in those groups, maybe there would be somebody who would 
be kind enough to send me some text that, that we should actually add because we actually have to specify the syntax in uh, in detail. Uh, and then the, there was uh, a discussion. Uh, uh, Matthias Kovac and I, uh, myself discussed a little bit uh, during the hackathon about uh, possibly adding uh, uh, Web of Things identifi uh, device identification schemes that that he's he's developing. Um, and this sort of would seem to possibly fall under the dev URNs, but it could also be separate thing. I remember the dev URNs are not the only way of identifying devices. You can still use UUIDs. You can still use uh, you know regular URLs even, and, and so on and so forth. So, or email numbers and so forth. So dev URNs is the, sort of the catch all of the you know, things that we missed or have not defined before. Uh, we can add more, but we can also do separate. And, and in, in this uh, Web of Things um, scheme, I, I, I think the, um, it, it would seem at least that, that that's, that's a thing where you have to define the set or the next step is to define the semantics of that, how, how they get allocated underneath this, this high level thing, uh, branch of the tree and then um, go from there. I, I would re recommend that that's probably a, a separate draft. Um, so that's it, really. So, you know, feedback on the template, um, answer to my question on the different components that could or could not be used in in the URN, and then what to do about these additional things. I, I think my general approach is that if if I don't get text um, or you know clarity on on some additional thing, then my my inclination would be to publish the I'll try and publish the the RFC. Because you can always, I mean, it's possible to add more branches to under dev and later also. So that's it. Looking for feedback. Sorry, can you remind me, is UUID already one of the types? I'm sorry, I didn't quite hear you. Is U, UUID. Taylor. So my name is Dave Taylor. The question is, can you remind me, is UUID already one of the types? No, no, that, that's a separate. URN type. Okay, so you're saying it's not you, just under use the, you just use the UUID colon or whatever instead of the URN colon. Right. That one, and that's why it's not in there. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So so my, my point was that there's other URN types that you can also use to identify. That are not under things. the URN colon yeah. scheme. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's URN in the general sense, there's URN in the scheme name sense, yeah. yeah. Um, hi, I'm Padu from Nokia. Uh, so this uh, third bullet about uh, decision and text, um, not unclear like what is expected from lightweight m2m uh, but uh, what we have done is i believe uh, with 1.1 release right now what we are working in oma uh, we have uh, uh, the urns and urls are basically i understand it's all under uri so lightweight m2m could do a uri meaning anything under the subset can be a device id that's what we have uh, update, updated. Uh, it's still a draft, so it's unclear like how to handle that. Okay, so so I I'm not very well aware of the the details of what you guys are are doing. So that that might be a you know maybe a offline thing for us to look into. This. I I would fully understand uh, what's going on there, and and maybe it's the case that we don't need to do anything. I'm just basically standing here saying that if you if anybody has a burning need to add things these uh, URN types, then now would be a good time to say, yes, please add, and then give me text. Otherwise, we're moving ahead. Yeah, I don't see a lot of screaming or requests or more answers, so. Thank you very much for the uh, update. So in the meanwhile, um, the next one, I believe, is the, this one is done, just a second. There. Make a request there. It maybe that doesn't work. Yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. So for whoever hasn't seen, oh, yeah. haven't seen the, hasn't seen the presentation on, on resource directory yesterday, my name is Kastin Amsus. And I will present it, be presenting uh, um, the latest state of the echo and request tag. Um, okay. <coughs> the, 
the the echo and request tag document um, that Göran, John, and I are working on. So um, just for a brief context, um, what this does is um, um, provide solutions to some um, to some security issues that were found with uh, with basic co-op mechanisms and the um, and the DTLS bindings that also show up in other security wrappers. So, for example, um, <clears throat> what happens if um, if packages get over, get delayed for a really long time um, by an adversary? And this document provides uh, some solu some solutions to that. Um, there is, in parallel to it, a document that um, that outlines all the attacks that is being updated constantly. Um, but this should be concise and and provide everything that's needed. For example, for Oscor to um, to solve those issues and to also solve, solve those issues with with other security bindings. So what happened since um, since the last meeting is that uh, token processing was added. This would now update RFC seven two five two because um, the as DTS uh, tokens were described to work over. Um, over DTLS, uh, those could result in responses being matched to requests that they don't belong to. So this is one of the updates. Um, that has, um, the second update is that the the whole echo section was a bit shuffled around to be um, readable more easily. And oops, oops, USB C connectors at work. Oh, so wasn't that me? I touched my okay. Never okay. do that. Um, and the, th the third part is that the request tag option, which originally had quite a bit of details on how this interacts with blockwise and assembly of options, can be much easier, provided that the understanding that we've come to develop of how blockwise is intended to work um, is correct. Uh, now, we've discussed this with various people in the working group already um, during, the, during the last few days. And it probably um, that understanding is probably correct, and that means that the option is just what has been suggested in RFC seven nine five nine as if you want to do kind of um, s sort of simultaneous blockwise operations, just add an option that is safe to forward and part of the cache key. Now, request tag will be exactly that option, and it won't need any normative text on how it is used server side because this is just how it can work with blockwise anyway. And the text we are having there is how do you apply this in if you're a client and it matters to you that your blocks aren't shuffled around. Um, this in the in the current draft version, this is only being hinted at because it, as I said, it is in under active development. Um, there will be an updated version roughly at the end of the week or shortly after that, um, which will be a bit shorter. And if you if you have anything if you have any opinion of whether that well this can work that way by saying that um, blockwise operates on cache key data and if it's part of the cache key the the blocks are safe if you have any opinion on that please voice it now because the results of this will probably go also into into lightweight implementation guide, guidance and basically um, clarify what was intended with RFC seven nine five nine. Um, if someone has divergent opinions of that, please utter them because otherwise we'll, we will proceed on with uh, working on that. Uh, so the, the, on that the, the, the normative part will be this option has no semantics. Um, <laughs> the normative part will will largely be to the server this option has no semantics. Yes. Yeah, and uh, of course we still want to keep the informative part why we are defining this thing. And also, it, it's uh, probably a good idea to have a common understanding in the co-op community which option you use for sending something that doesn't have any semantics because you want to to keep yeah. block requests uh, together. Yes. So I think it's just There's moving out, uh, moving over some material. It's not really actually a, a big change, but uh, yeah, yeah, good. Um, so um, as soon as that new version is out, um, I'd I'd ask you to to review it. So it can proceed easily because it's basically just fixing stuff that is already well understood. Can we see a few hands of people who would like to review this? Jim, Carsten, Jaime. Oh, I can't see you. 
Julian, Francesca, Michael. Okay, that, that should be enough. Thank you. Um, so um, I think that the timeline of this uh, should be, we shouldn't be sitting for too long on it uh, because it, it solves some, some real problems. Um, so uh, uh, yeah, next version, reviews, we're going to blast call, ship it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So um, we are back to our favorite uh, uh, item. We, we started that uh, discussion uh, yesterday afternoon. And uh, we, we still have to, to finish the discussion. And uh, I, I offered my discussion um, um, contribution here on, on this slide and, and everybody has had a, a chance to think about uh, the, the pending uh, issue during the last 20 hours or so. Um, so I, I would love to hear other views on, on this uh, subject. How do, should we handle this in general and how do we handle specifically the, the uh, pending requirement that, that comes from the EST uh, document. So anybody have an opinion on this? One person is getting up. One person is leaving the room. No. Um. <laughs> was a long way. Uh, Matthias Kovac, Siemens. So what I see from the two proposals um, are two different strategies. One is to handle it explicitly as part of the states of the state machine. And the other one is um, basically the mechanics of the state machine that we want to define. Um, so the proposal having a new response codes and so on, this is more on a meta level. So there um, it's basically some basic implementation that has to deal with that. Um, you do not have to think about it in your application. Uh, the maybe proposal is more, okay, you have to design your applications following the state uh, machine thoughts, um, kind of the hypermedia way how to do this. And um, yeah, have it explicit in your application. So a question is, um, are all applications yeah, recommended to follow this approach? Of course, it's something we would like to see, but maybe it goes a bit too far if we kind of make them all do this um, and use uh, the media types as they should be. Uh, we have a lot of proposals um, yeah, that use co-op in a more simple way, that use what is defined there, and they don't put so much thought into how to design a hypermedia-driven application, meaning these uh, thinking about what are the states of the state machine and so on, what is the right uh, media type to use, and, and so on. Um, I think in particular for this PubSub draft, um, a nicer solution for that would be to have it in on the meta level, so meaning the new response code, because pops up, um, yeah, people who we want to uh, adapt that uh, won't think in this hypermedia terms. So these are my thoughts on this. So it's uh, I see it's it's two different strategies how to solve this. One is on the meta level, um, having it um, how state machines can be defined using co-op. And the other one is, okay, you have to model this with the means co-op gives you directly in the state machine of your application. That would be the, the maybe version or proposal. Yes, but no, no. what position do you take on this? I'm, maybe I'm not quite following. <laughs> So, so I don't have a strong one, um, as I said, so it depends on the application. So on the one hand side, um, it would be nice if more applications would follow the, the hypermedia driven approach. Um, would be good to have something there, but then if I look at the, the case of PubSub, where we want to, to have people at least move, let's say, from MQTT to, to core PubSub, where we have some more uh, metadata on what is the content center around, uh, we have more features for interoperability. Um, then let's make it easy for them. And then I, I think this uh, response code solution is uh, a nicer one. There are cases for both. That, that's kind of the, the main message. So, so I see both solutions. They um, are valid, but it's two different domains where they are valid. And um, so I, I haven't thought a lot um, about the EST use case. 
Um, but I think there it's uh, a similar uh, case. It's it's not people designing hypermedia driven applications, but it's uh, they're using the co-op protocol and they look, okay, what are the mechanics of this protocol and how does it map to my problem? And um, so it's, I think, the same bin as this PubSub, uh, yeah, where they just want to, to have uh, some mechanics on the meta level of the protocol and define what needs to be done. Uh, Peter van der Stok, because it's my turn, I think, to say. Uh, actually, I agree completely with Matthias uh, yeah. uh, about uh, if you have a response code, it is of a more general nature than when you use the media format. The media format actually is for an, a client which talks to a server and they are part of one application. So they know about what things are going and there's no need to export all this knowledge about what the media format means. Well, in the other case, when you want to have a more general service, uh, well, you have the response code, I think it can be used also by other applications, you should like to try a response code. I understand that there are problems because there may be proxies which do not understand it and do not pass through the values as you wish. And on the other side, it might be that you have a client who gets a response back who doesn't understand it. I think that it depends very much on the type of a response code that you do and the kind of consequences which are passed to this return, which should actually help the working group decide if one likes to keep this response code and introduce it or not. Are you going to answer to this or can I? No, okay. Uh, Alexander Pelov. So I, I'd like to see like a, a one use case or an application that will say, you know, how does this map and why do we do this? So it seems to me like it's a pretty meta approach and um, like, yes, we could do it and yes, but what it will serve for, like one specific use case and I want to see, okay, well, we solve this problem and and then we can say, yes, it's interesting or or maybe not. Michael Koster, smart things. Um, <laughs> excuse my voice. I, um, I, yeah, I agree with the the idea that this is more application oriented, and the idea of a response code, status code, is more transfer layer. So, um, you know, PubSub. I, I agree that PubSub just transfers representations. So we really probably can't try to synthesize media types in PubSub. Uh, in terms of the other use case, I don't have much to say, but I think I'd like to see a little more discussion on what's wrong with response codes. Okay, Carsten, moment from the floor. Um, I'm, I'm a computer scientist, and uh, I think good computer scientists are fundamentally lazy. Um, so um, applying this uh, principle here, uh, should we have this kind of discussion each time somebody comes up with an application? Um, if we can come up with a couple of response codes that we really think add something to the ecosystem in a general sense, I, I would be really happy to, to embrace them. But the, the two response codes that, that uh, or the two applications that, that have been discussed here uh, so far, um, those are just specific things. And uh, we, we I do believe we should guide application de developers uh, to defining media types for their application states. So, um, yeah, on, on one hand, I, I agree with uh, Matthias, maybe to the level of. Uh, saying yes, there, there, there is a decision to be made, um, but I would prefer to, to only have uh, response codes uh, for things that, that actually are, are somewhat universal. Now to the question, what's bad about a response code? Um, that's uh, in, in general, nothing is bad about a response code. So for instance, uh, we can add uh, 4xx and uh, 5xx uh, response codes as soon as we understand what we're trying to do. And, and we will do that for too many messages. Um, a success response code has a bit more baggage to it because we are assuming that 
the the co-op layer knows how to handle this uh, response code. So uh, things like like proxies, but also the the co-op layers, the caching layer in a client implementation uh, has to know about the response code. And what I really don't want to uh, get is a situation in which somebody cannot get their application going uh, because their co-app layer, their co-app library, or the, the proxy that they're using uh, hasn't defined that response code yet. So that, that's really a bad situation where to, to make a deployment you actually have multiple entities to agree that it's a good idea to do that deployment. We generally try to avoid that. So that's why I, I generally think we should guide application developers towards solving this with the means that, that uh, Coop has already available, and, and one of these means is uh, media types. Now, on, on the general question of um, having a resource and that resource isn't currently quite in a state to, to provide useful information. Um, I think one property of, of this situation is that the, the application probably wants to say something about the characteristics of this state of not yet having useful information. So uh, in some cases, it may want to say, come here again in 30 minutes. Uh, in some cases, it may want to, to say, um, oh, um, nobody has submitted anything to this topic yet, but here's a default value, um, and so on. Um, so this, this is fundamentally application-specific and calls for an application-specific media type already. Um, so I, I don't think it's a lot of onus on an application developer to, to develop that media type. And the, the final observation, um, one problem we ran into uh, when, when looking at uh, the PubSub case is that observe currently requires all the notifications in a stream of responses uh, to have the same content format. Uh, that may have been a mistake. So, um, yeah, maybe we want to fix that mistake, but maybe people don't agree it's a mistake. So, um, I'm interested to hear my input. Asek, you, you didn't have, or that was already? Okay. Um, yeah, so, so I came a bit late to this discussion, so, so I discussed a bit during the hackathon. Uh, what is the issue there? Um, so for the PubSub use case, it is exactly what Carsten just mentioned. Um, to me, um, yeah, at first glance, it feels like, okay, this is kind of a, a, a strong correction of, of or um, change in the observe RFC. Um, maybe then having something more drastic, let's say, like a response code that can fix that might be the, the right direction because um, there were some thoughts why it should be the same uh, media uh, uh, content format uh, during an observation. Um, I think that's that's something we should uh, think about. So, so the, the main point is it's connected to to a lot of other decisions that that have been made. And um, now that uh, more and more applications pop up, uh, we actually get more evidence what would have been maybe the, the right decision. Um, with the response codes, um, it's a bit similar to to the the methods. So we. We originally stuck to, to a minimal set. Then it turned out, yeah, actually, these additional uh, methods are a good idea. They, they help optimizing. Um, they they uh, solve particular use cases, uh, especially if you look at fetch. And um, for the response code, so for instance, there's also still this gap. What if, if you just want to say, yes, this was uh, processed correctly, the resource state didn't change, so it's not a change. Um, there's no content to return. Um, there's also still a gap, and uh, it's it's like the workarounds that we had, uh, let's say in HTTP, when there was no patch method to to send a post, and everything was a bit yeah sloppy, let's say, because uh, there 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 was a gap in the specification. So I think um, with the, the the evidence that we have, maybe we can collect more of these use cases where everyone has a problem to pick the right solution from from the the RFCs and and think rethink uh, what are the response codes that that we need. 
So again, it's it's a, uh, it's connected to many issues actually. So it's not really okay. What do we need to solve this EST or this particular uh, PubSub problem? But uh, more in the, the overall design space. So the, the the way that you describe it, Matthias, the the new response code actually would have uh, semantics that are quite similar to two o five, except that the the uh, what you get back is not the content but some some meta information about that content. Is that what you were yeah, so, saying? Yes, so so it's it's. So, so this isn't fully figured out. So it's uh, I started thinking about this during the hackathon. So the 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 one thing uh, about this response code in question here, it tells you okay, there's this resource, everything is fine, but there is no content. So it's kind of this uh, HTTP 204 no content, um, and something similar uh, was missing in these cases where you send a post to to process something, and uh, you don't change resource state. There's also kind of no content to deliver it, but that is more like a 200 okay, a generic okay, I processed this correctly, and maybe the, the 200 is uh, too generic for, for saying that. Um, maybe it, it's the same thing that we need, it's some two something something, uh, no content that uh, would fill, uh, solve two, these two issues. The, the 204, the HTTP 204 actually has, uh, even though it's, it's described as no content, has a slightly different semantics. Um, which is the previous content you already got for this is still valid and you don't have to mm -hmm. update it. Um, it. It's really weird that this thing is called no content. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure we can draw a parallel to, to HTTP here, uh, but maybe that's one question that we, we should uh, try to decide for this, this uh, new uh, response code. What, what does it mean about the actual uh, content behind that uh, resource that may already be cached. So is that replaced um, or is, is, uh, is it still valid like in the HTTP 204 case? Mm -hmm. uh, just an observation, observation here. Um, so the 204 I think was also returned if you change something because HTTP doesn't have the explicit changed response code and so on. So this is originally already this, this problem. Okay, I don't really have the right thing to pick from. Um, there's the general confusion uh, from, from the name of the response code to the actual semantics. And uh, we, uh, I think, are stuck in the same problem here, um, but with the expectation that co-op is for machine to machine, so we have to be way more explicit about all this. Yeah, so uh, I, I would uh, propose that we uh, define a new response code, not what you wanted, and uh, that is used for, for um, uh, representations that come back that are not what was originally uh, um, requested, uh, but that, that somehow are, are useful in the application uh, to, to make progress. And successful. And successful, yes. Okay. Successful, not what you wanted. <laughs> Not cacheable, I think that that's a significant uh, observation here. And may have a different content format, keeps the observation alive. Can you use the microphone? Michael Coster, smart things. Yeah. Um, on, on further reading, the 204 does uh, in HTTP does instruct the client to use the previous value, so that would not be appropriate for the pub sub case. The same semantic. We do need something a little different. Um, the I believe the other one was uh, more analogous to 202 accepted, which says something like I might process this later or I might not. <clears throat> and I 202 accepted is used in some IoT APIs. Um, for go, go, go deal with this some other way. Like, um, for example, one, one API uses it to indicate that you're supposed to go get your asynchronous notifications somewhere else. So you okay. do an HTTP thing that says, hey, uh, like I want to observe, but it says, it gives you back a 202, and it says, here's where you go observe this thing. And that's, that's or it's not a redirect, but it's a, <laughs> I, I'm processing this, but you, you have to get your answer somewhere else. I'm not sure if that's exactly what um, Peter's use case is either, but um, 
I think what, what you said is I kind of agree with that. That's really what the semantics of what we want to say for PubSub is. It's not what you wanted in a general case. So doing that would cover PubSub and as well as maybe some other general cases. Arkeran Eriksson, um, I think we need a response code, but maybe the one you suggest is something generic. Okay, yeah. Here's more information how to go forward. Maybe that is actually the right solution here. So instead of having three yeah. new success codes, just having one that is relatively future-proof. I think that would be solving the pop-up case and most likely the ESD case too. So I would think it makes sense to explore that. So I think what, what Michael just said is, is interesting. There are cases out there that we could look at and, and um, uh, particular IoT cases uh, out there. And maybe we should uh, spend a couple of days of collecting these cases. So if you have a pointer to, to the API, so other people can, can look at uh, that as well, uh, that would be a useful thing to, to take to the list. So for once, I think take to the list is exactly the, the right thing. Um, but uh, we have a couple of days at this ITF, so we can continue discussing uh, this. But it seems to me we, we are kind of converging on, on something. Uh, here. Great. So let's uh, jump into PubSub itself. Where's the pointer? There. Yeah. Yep. Okay, I'm going to just go through all three of these since they're all in order. I just made one set of slides for the whole thing. Um, PubSub. We did not as get as much work as we hoped done, but we made some incremental progress. Um, you can look at the uh, screen in front of oh, you. Oh, thanks. <laughs> so what we want to do is um, split out these response codes into separate drafts so that, 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 that there's no dependency or, or impact. And we're going to need to, ref well, we're creating a dependency, but we don't want them internal in the draft. We want them to be, as, as Carson said, general purpose for, you know, for everyone to use, so we'd like to just um, refer to those, whatever the no content one, that's the T TBD. Too many requests seems to be less controversial, so um, that shouldn't be a problem. Now that we have a really clear idea of how um, PubSub and groups and multicast and different sort of security considerations are at least a better idea than we had a year ago, we're ready to put um, some specific stuff into the security considerations for OS core. And there are some more issues and comments that we need to address. Um, some really good issues, really, some, some sort of un, unspecified cases, like um, we have a PubSub resource that's a resource type that works sort of like the RD resource type does, where you that's where you sort of access the functions and queries and stuff. And um, the question is, do all the topics sort of show up under that in the tree, or do they sort of are they able to be sort of created just anywhere? Um, <clears throat> conditional notification. It seems like conditional notification and PubSub are two patterns that really need to be used together. Um, even though we don't really have the numeric stuff, we have PMIN and PMAX that would be really good for controlling you know, the flow of data, a, a proactive way instead of depending on 429 when things go wrong. So we'd like to look at that. And uh, also DynLink, just to be able to use dynamic links with PubSub. How do you use that with a broker? Do we create a binding table on the broker or do we have a way of putting link bindings with associating with topics in the tree? So um, that needs to be, that needs to be worked. And also there are some questions around how topic discoveries work with topic trees when you create things um, with a number of levels all at once. Are there intermediate nodes created? And we need to be clear about that. And there may be a couple of other small issues, but I think this is the flavor of what's left to uh, nail down before, before we're done. So um, that bit of work left to be done. We'd like to schedule an interim meeting so that we can be ready for uh, uh, last call by the next IETF. That's basically how we'd like to uh, proceed. So sort of do a one big final push, sort of the way we did with RD to just get everything in and uh, get it done before the, as a deadline for IETF 102. Yeah, that, that raises an interesting question. We, we have been using uh, virtual interims in the core group a lot uh, previously. 
um, but not recently. And uh, we may want to get back into the habit of having some. Now, what would be the right time for an interim meeting that, that finishes? Pops up. That's a good question. It kind of feels like it's like next month sometime or, or April or May, right? Are you sure that you can do this in one month? Well, I, maybe. <laughs> so when is the, well, the IETF is July. Yeah. So, uh, so it could be the, June. The, the, the mid the <sighs> mid point would be sometime in May. Right. That's, yeah. And uh, we also could go for two interim meetings, and then one would be early May, and the other one would be late June or something like that. Um, At this point, it doesn't feel like we have that much work to yeah. do. Yeah. But I could be surprised. <laughs> We can be surprised. Okay, so we, we don't have to do the scheduling now, but uh, maybe we can take down that we want to have something in, in April or May um, as an interim meeting, at least yeah. for this and maybe for a few other things like, like the new yeah. response. Code I think maybe even as well. some of the others too that we yep. want to continue to um, uh, wait. For. And, and earlier is probably better because we really kind of have an idea of the scope now, but if we get some more working group review and some more comments, the scope may get larger. So um, please, if, if anyone really cares, now's the time to do the review. So who, who has read a version of the PubSub uh, uh, document? Well, there are almost 20 hands. And uh, who is willing to contribute a, a review of the document? Jim, <laughs> I see a hand, but I can't see the person behind that. Thank you, Krista, and um, two. Well, two is better than, than nothing. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, no discussion. Yes? Oh, you split the slides. Yes, because oh, okay. we have two, two <laughs> items. Okay, uh, so. Go ahead. Um, yeah, okay, great. Um, Michael, um, before we go forward, if we have time, and it would be good to discuss the point, like, um, by the way, this is Ari Kerenen, uh, discuss the point, where do we want our uh, topic tree, tree to land? Do we always want it to have under the API resource, or would we like to have the topics anywhere? So that's the first mm -hmm. bullet over here. Yep. Um, I, I can see arguments either way. Uh, we couldn't really conclude, like, what is the right way to go here? Or does anyone even care? Is this something we we need to prescribe, given that it's all linked together in the in the PubSub broker anyway? No, there's a link to everything, and and you know it, it it's there's no it doesn't really break anything. So the leaning toward yeah, you can put starts with slash URI if you want, or you can put relative URI when you create a topic, and it'll do the right thing because those are all well known patterns. So then the um, broker would just deny requests that are not compatible with whatever policy it's using. I think that's one way we can describe it if we don't want to have any normative text on the draft on that. But anyway, I guess that, that's okay. But we'll need to add description of what happens. So it's an ambiguous right now. Okay, other questions, comments? So um, I'm going to talk about interfaces in DynLink now, which um, which are also um, pretty close in our opinion. So the interfaces draft is really just informational. We define some um, some link attributes, IF, and it, interfaces draft basically is uh, some high level guidance about what this IF attribute is about. And you can use it to say this thing is a sensor, this thing's an actuator, this thing is a collection that has stuff in it. It's basically an application. Uh, layer tag that's, that tells you how to process the resource. Um, so originally, uh, other SDOs, not notably OCF, are using interface, and their examples are a lot different from ours. There was an idea that we would try to show what OS OCF is doing in our draft, but I think we've decided not to do that um, and to keep with our original examples. Uh, at least that's what we propose. Um, you can go look at the OCF spec if you want to see how OCF uses interfaces. 
And I don't really see a lot of value in duplicating all that in our IETF spec. It won't be normative. Um, maybe, maybe we, if it's really, if people feel strongly about it, we could bring in a couple of examples, but we should show different ways of doing it, if anything, and not, not try to imply that there's only one way to use the interfaces, um, target attribute, but what's happening? Is someone coming to the mic on Meet Echo? No. Why didn't the display change? Oh, okay, it doesn't matter. <laughs> All right, um, so that might be a little controversial, but that's done in, the, uh, in, in, in a reason to simplify things. And also, we're going to use uh, CINML. So it's sort of like the examples are going to be more CINML examples that show uh, content that's according to another IETF draft, which seems to be a little more consistent than bringing in stuff from an external SDO. And we have some remaining issues to close, but not too much. So we want to do the same thing here and address all those comments and issues before the next and prepare for working group last call. Um, you know, we may or may not be prepared by then, but we want to prepare for that at IETF 102. Do you want to prepare at IETF 102 or do you want to have the last call? We want IETF to have the last call at IETF 102, yes. Mm -hmm. But we want to be prepared to do that, I guess. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. I guess it's just a little, a little less certain that we'll have everything done versus PubSub, where we really sort of feel like we need to, to tie it up. But um, that's because, the, yeah, um, I guess we were just not quite sure about the state of that draft relative to the other ones. Right? Is that, am I representing this correctly, Bill? Is, Bill Silverajan has been doing a lot of the work on this draft lately, and um, but we're, we're all um, pulling together here. <laughs> okay, uh, so DynLink, DynLink is a little more uh, going on with it, but uh, probably a little less work to do. We really kind of understand the scope of how we want to finish DynLink. Uh, there are two components in the DynLink draft. There's uh, dynamic links that define, it sort of uses a link to define an asynchronous data transfer from one resource to another. So it's when, when this thing generates something that needs to be updated, then it causes the transfer to happen. Uh, the other thing in the draft is conditional notification parameters, which basically uh, we call them observe attributes in some other um, areas. And, and basically they, um, they control the notification behavior. So it's sort of the, the timing and how much the value needs to change and, and things like that. Um, now, the, the, the conditional notification parameters could be included in the dynamic link, so that's really one way to use them. You put them in the dynamic link, and that, that defines the, uh, the parameters of the notification links, how, how, how frequently and how much change. They can also be applied to a resource instance and be stored in a resource instance along with the resource to have sort of a global notification behavior for that resource. And they can also be, the third way that we've looked at is uh, applied to an observation instance to, <laughs> I guess I lost the rest of the sentence, but basically each observe can have its own set of parameters as well that you plug in with query parameters on the get. So um, we want to make sure we define all those three ways of using parameters really clearly. I think it's probably already there, but mainly we want to put the draft into two sections, have the dynamic links in one section and the observe parameters in the other. And then there's a the thing about a binding table, which is how you might organize things on a server, but they don't all have to be organized that way. It's, that's uh, optional. So we kind of know what we want to do with it. Um, we have one thing that we're adding, and that is uh, another notification attribute. We looked at a lot of different notification attributes to have a lot of different, uh, you know, tunable behavior and what have you. And the one that seemed to really stand out as being consistently, you know, people say, why didn't you do it this way, is to have the notification happen within a certain signal range, value range, and not when you're outside of that value range. And this was a really popular, this was uh, in, in working with lightweight M2M, originally a lot of the folks thought that that's what LT and GT were for, was to say you only notify when you're between LT and GT or, or outside limits or whatever, you know, they, want, they wanted to have the uh, endpoint be quiet when nothing was happening and only do notifications when something unusual was happening. 
So um, we're adding the band attribute to modify the behavior of LT and GT to be this notify within band. So if you use LT and GT in that band as a Boolean uh, flag, then you get the, the, the special behavior on those. If you don't, you just get notifications when LT and GT are crossed as a limit, sort of a crossing limit behavior. And then finally, we decided not to rename LT, even though resource directory uses LT as lifetime, we don't see any significant conflict there. So we'd like to keep this as LT. And Dave Taylor, can you uh, clarify when you're actually using it as a band pass, um, can you say only notify when you're outside the range? Yes, you just make LT greater than GT. Okay, so you allow both yeah. within this and on exactly. both ends. Okay, band that's, exclusive okay. I wasn't as well. clear if you allowed both. So band exclusive is maybe the usual case. Yeah, because uh, your example there with the and there implies that it's only when it's in between the two, right? Instead of on the two extremes, right? And so oh, it's a second right, right. Greater than GT and less than right. LT. So in other that's, words, that's if I want correct. to be silent in the normal range and be signaled only when it's outside normal range, then it's actually the opposite of that example, right? And so you're saying you allow both. That's right. GT is normally the lower one if you want in band, and GT is the upper one if you want out of band. Uh, right. So whether it's an and or an or depends on whether GT or LT values are higher versus lower, right? You're exactly. saying that's how you switch. Exactly. Okay. That's it. and we'll we'll clarify that in the in the draft. Yeah. We'll, <laughs> we'll, we probably need some examples there to show yeah, yeah, yeah. some ASCII art that I signed up to create a little ASCII art to illustrate those. And uh, the roadmap. The last changes are scoped. We want to you know. Do these, do these three things. Security considerations, um, we didn't really talk a lot about that, but when you have a dynamic link, there's sort of an implication that there's some client functionality there that has to process the link to do the to output, you know, to generate a transaction, and, and that has a lot of security implications, like who's doing it, what's the subject, if you have ACLs, where does, you know, so I think it's out of scope for the draft, but it definitely needs to be um, brought up as a security consideration and needs to be resolved in any real system that uses these. Right, and we wanna also um, have working group last call at the next IETF. So I say prepare, but it means prepare to have everything ready so that we can ask for last call if, if um, that seems to make sense. Good. So I forgot to ask the question for interfaces, but I'm going to ask it for DynLink uh, first. Who has read a recent version of the DynLink document? Christian and one hand behind Carlos. So who's that? Uh, ah, thank you. More than. Um, and who would be willing to uh, contribute a review? Christian. And Christian, okay, and Modern and Ari, thank you. And on the subject of the interfaces document, who has read a re recent version? Uh, Christian and Zeg. So we probably should reserve the first row for Christian because he has read all the drafts. <laughs> <clears throat> and who would be willing to con contribute a review of interfaces? Christian. It's always a bit harder to get people to review informational documents, so uh, we, we know that, but it's probably still worth uh, finishing this, this work. Okay, I think we're done. Next. Bill. Yeah. Um, all right. So we'll start with protocol negotiation first. So there are two two drafts right now that um, that are separated for alternative transports. One one is for describing where the uh, transport information should be uh, residing in the URI, and the other one is for discovering uh, alternative transport endpoints. So protocol negotiation is about about doing the second part. A uh, bit of context. So. Um, the, the document aims at um, talking about co-op nodes that have multiple transports, and then they wish to allow uh, co-op requests and response to um, use some or all of these transports. So uh, we started with thinking only about uh, per-server models, but then um, recent discussions 
um, also um, showed that, that per resource models are useful. Um, and then also the, the, the draft evolved. Uh, so initially we, we went with a core uh, resource directory only model and then uh, right now we also have a model where you can directly query the origin service for the available transports. Okay. Um, current status. So um, at, in beyond draft 08, uh, uh, we did not introduce anything new. We um, clarified some of the uh, parameters based on reviews that we received. Um, and also thanks to Christian for doing good work on the resource directory. So from that, we were able to do quite a lot more. Um, we have the, um, the OL, other locations uh, attribute that um, allows multiple base URIs and to align it with the way uh, OCF does it. Um, and then we have the AT and uh, TT parameters, which are also repeatable that um, you, you do the same thing with the, with the resource directory. So uh, there was a request to uh, provide more complex examples and that was incorporated with the current draft. And then there's uh, uh, some uh, example usage that's updated with the way uh, resource directory is structured right now. Um, that's basically it. So next steps we have are, um, so um, one thing that I omitted in this slide is basically that we, we have a huge uh, section that we need to consider for security. So security considerations plays a really important part in this area. So um, uh, something that I neglected to put in the slides. But anyway, uh, we're, we're still looking to see if there are um, other mechanisms that we can use um, in terms of the in terms of uh, allowing the uh, client server discovery for alternate transports. And um, one way is uh, looking and seeing. Uh, some of the suggestions actually came from the corridor discussions that we had, and some came from the from the um, the reviews and. Um, these were some methods that we think we will going forward we'll try to evaluate them and see if there are any of them have any any viable ways of doing that so um for example using 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 fetch to um provide um, a payload when you do a request and uh, and then retrieving the list of uh, transport endpoints or then uh using uh, a well-known location for site-wide metadata uh, or then doing what we do in dine links with uh, binding table entry. So in that sense that basically we can just um, use a resource, a resource collection and then try to uh, add or delete um, uh, web links that tell where the locations of the um, of the endpoints are. Uh, that's it, I think. So uh, any questions about that? Okay, so who has uh, read the recent version of uh, this document? Christian has, no surprise. Um, yeah, I think a few other people have, but uh, I'm afraid to put up their hand because they, I might ask them to put in a review. Um, so I think th these two documents, uh, th th they're currently two separate uh, documents, um, but maybe we want to revisit that at some point. Um, so um, maybe we can go into the, the other document quickly and then and, and discuss yeah. this some more. Yeah, the other document is even easier since um, this, this work um, is, is currently, uh, in my opinion, it's complete. So we'll just, um, um, actually, from, from the point of view of Lightweight and 2 since we have now multiple transports, I, I believe the protocol negotiation one could be also useful. Um, we are finishing 1.1, 1 .1, maybe on 1 1.2. It could be something discussed. I don't know what Padu or SAC or Hannes, he's in the room, would think. But it sounds like a useful feature. Yeah, I, I would be happy to get some text to, to um, look at examples of how um, OCF or, or, or uh, OMA uh, would that work matter in time. Certainly. <coughs> yeah. Okay, so is that okay? Right. okay, so um, coming back to the second um, slide set, um, alternate transports was um, originally we, we we looked at the work to see um, and this was this was at the point when we had not yet done RFC um, A three two three and uh, and um, there were drafts emerging looking at how co op was being used other or other transports than UDP, so we wanted to figure out how. Um, 
if, if, you, if, you wish to, if you wish to expose the transport endpoint uh, in a URI, uh, how do you do it? So um, uh, the, the, work, the work took a while and, um, and we discovered that um, when you look at all the URI components, uh, you can't put it in the query, the path, and the authority, and certainly not the fragment. And um, with the requirements that we had, it, the, the only place that left to do that was in the um, URI scheme. So um, the draft um, basically just crystallizes that point, um, which tells you the design decisions that that uh, were, drove the, the, the decision that currently um, uh, is being used by uh, RFC 8323 to uh, list uh, the core TCP and web sockets uh, information in the URI scheme. So the, the current current drop 11 is just a small delta. And uh, yeah, that's basically it. So it seems to me this, this draft is in a weird state because it, it documents analysis that, that led to uh, RFC 8323 being what it is. Um, but uh, yeah, um, how are we going to use this analysis next? Um, so one, one thing that, that we left unfinished uh, when we completed A323 was um, how do you actually uh, do a URL scheme that uh, is open with respect to the, the transport? Uh, being done. And we, we kind of have an, an unpaid IOU with Adam Roach on this one because we agreed with him that, that we should have such a UI, UI scheme as well, but we haven't really done the work on that yet. And I think the protocol negotiation draft certainly will go into that in, in some form. Um, this will go into that in some form. Um, but also we, we probably want to specifically define what, what such an uh, URL scheme, which, which has been referred to as CoAP plus AT for, for by some people, how that and uh, how such a URL scheme would work in practice. Uh, now, Dave is going to remind us that OCF already has such a, a URL scheme, which which is uh, uh, specific to the way OCF is naming endpoints. Um, and uh, maybe that, that is also something that we, we also have to uh, take into consideration when doing something like a, a more general co-op uh, plus AT uh, scheme. So I think we, we, have, we have two nice pieces of raw material here, and we have an unfinished uh, unpaid check. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, where, where we take it from here? Dave. Uh, Dave Taylor, uh, what Carson said I was going to say. Um, and then uh, to extend on that, I'd say uh, my comment is not entirely specific to OCF, although you're correct that that is sort of the, the, the uh, main case that uh, we know of today that's making use of, of co-op and so on. Um, but I would say anytime that you have an organization or a vendor or whatever that makes use of uh, co-op, but potentially makes use of transports besides co-app, um, then such an organization would probably never use a co-app-at. They need something that wasn't co-app specific. Like OCF colon isn't co-app specific. You can have EPs that are, you know, co-app plus TCP, HTTP, something else that isn't invented yet or whatever, right? Because it's an agnostic higher layer that you can resolve to any transport. And so uh, when you're talking about um, transports, whether you're talking about transports under co-app or whether you're talking about transports that include co-app and there's other things, you know, HTTP or, you know, what have you that's in parallel to that, that some higher level protocol might run over. Um, all that's part of the larger uh, protocol negotiation or uh, endpoint discovery problem. OCF discovers that by having a higher layer that is not a co-app specific layer, right? It's just a generic resource layer, right? And so uh, that's something we should take into account when trying to figure out what the scope of these things is and to what extent we're gonna go to co-app plus AT, is anybody going to use it? And if so, how, right? That's, that's what we should know. Because uh, right now OCF would never use that, right? And we should do it to, so that somebody would actually use it. And if our customers in OCF, we should figure out what the requirements are and tailor it to somebody that would actually use it. So let, let me throw the straw man. Uh, we rename this UI scheme into rest colon slash slash. 
Now you know what the implications of that are. Huh? When you say uh, this scheme, you mean the co-op plus AT scheme? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's exactly the sort of thing that I'm arguing for, is to say, if you do that, and then you can use, you know, whether it's, you know, OL or whatever, which can point to things which may or may not start with co-op plus, okay? Because you don't, if you don't constrain it to that so that it could be extended in the future if something else comes along, then yes, that's exactly what I'm arguing for, yeah. Okay. And, and then you're basically covering the OCF use case, and it depends on, you know, what the rest of the syntax says, which you mentioned, you know, what's the right way that you're naming things and so on, and what you're naming things along the lines of what uh, Yari presented or something else, right? Right, Michael, not at the mic, Michael Koster, that's a generalization of the pattern, so. I actually just want to sit down. Uh, it should be. Uh, let, let's check. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, David's uh, um, reminding us that we have a joint meeting on Friday between um, OCF, uh, W3C, Web of Things, and, and uh, T2T uh, So that, that would definitely be something that we want to coordinate if we want to go forward with that. So who can write the draft uh, so we can look at it on Friday? <laughs> Yeah, so I, I think the, the most critical issue is one that has irked us uh, for a long time, which is endpoint naming. And uh, I think we finally have to bite the bullet on this one and, and uh, agree what, what we want to do uh, there. So, Bill, can we count on you in, in helping us with that? Not by Friday. But... Not by Friday. <laughs> I, I'm perhaps I can I can I can take a first stab at this. Okay, so I I take it that we just have transmogrified this uh, set of two documents into a slightly larger work item, which is again an unpaid check that that we still have with Adam uh, Roach, um, and uh, also something that I think the community really could use. So uh, let's take this discussion offline and and uh, make some progress there. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so we finally have arrived at the flexible time uh, part um, of uh, the meeting. And right now the, the only um, set, slide set I have is about OPC UA. Laurent, do you want to say anything about the time scale thing? Nothing, nothing new to report, okay. Um, so where are we with time scale? Do we want to have working group adoption? Do, what are the next steps there? Yes, long to time. Yes, I would like to have a working group adoption, but uh, it's a working group that uh, have to put comment on, on this draft. So the goal was to to have some um, when you send a uh, co-op request, then to say how long you can keep it in uh, in the server. So when you have very slow devices, it could be very important. But we need feedback from the from the group on this. Okay. So who else is interested in, in this option? Okay, all the LP WAN people uh, are raising their hand. So um, yeah, we know who you are. Good. Um, yeah. So so maybe we should take this offline and, and maybe use a break uh, at some point and, and discuss how to make progress with this. Okay. So that, that was the timescale segment and now let's go to the OPC UA segment. There are seven names on this slide. I don't know who, who's actually going to present this. So we had a presentation on this uh, last time and there was some pretty good feedback from the working group. Uh, so I'm looking forward to this. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, this is Jun Jun Rui Wu and our draft name is OPC UA message transmission method over crop. We have presented it at last meeting and we updated this new version. Oh, sorry. We made some meaningful changes according to the last meeting commands, especially adding some use cases. So we add some in this version. 
for res resource constraint industrial scenarios, if we want to use OPCLA to consolidate different types of data and protocols into a unified information model, as well as using web service, HTTP is not a good choice because it's too heavy. Using crop instead of HTTP is a good, better choice because it can achieve lightweight communication. The first use cases was based on this, and we only needed to change OPCOA client and Savior to support this way. The second use case, use case is using crop to HTTP proxy. It's not necessary to change OPCOA client. With developing of the cloud technology, the factory data can be uploaded to the cloud for further processing. And many clouds APIs could support OPCOA and crop. So OPCOA over crop can light few devices to, uh, to let the field devices to use web, use cloud APIs directly and quickly. The other, the other change we consolidate two transmission schemes, the proxy for OPCOA crop and the direct transmission into one to realize better transmission performance. Due to the expired membership of OPC Foundation, we have not contacted with the OPC Foundation Working Group yet, and in the few weeks, we will contact with them for further feedback, and we will implement the transmission scheme mentioned above over a reasonable architecture. We think the combination of OPCOA and the crop is meaningful, so we wish to get more feedback. Thank you. Any comment or question? Uh, Dave Taylor, so yeah, I agree. Your next step should be to go to the uh, OPC Foundation, get reviewed there as we talked about last IETF, because it's, I think it's just informational to us that this work really belongs uh, if they accept it and the OPC Foundation not here, right? Because it's on top of us, it's a user of us. And so uh, they would be the ones that do the bindings from OPC UA to various things. Um, uh, within that, my comments are, are sort of technical comments or questions that are, would might be more appropriate in that forum than this one, but I'm happy to give them to you now since I'm here and I'm not there. Um, which uh, my understanding is that the, uh, only trans, although the OPC UA defines like three or four different transports, um, which you have the good picture in the in the draft. Um, the only one that's actually used is not HTTP; it's the one that's TCP. Um, and here you mentioned CoAP, and I don't remember if in the draft you talk about CoAP versus over UDP versus CoAP TCP. Um, but for the cloud, it seems like you'd care about the CoAP TCP thing. And so I guess that's part of a question here is, uh, do you assume it's CoAP TCP because you care about congestion control across the internet to the cloud? Um, and uh, the second question would be, have you compared the uh, compression that you get from uh, you know, CoAP and CBOR against the UA binaries compression when using uh, OPC UA TCP? And is it comparable? Is it significantly better or whatever? So that would be my questions. Okay, thank you, Dave. Good. So um, I, I think we, we continue to be interested in, in uh, uh, finding out what, what other organizations uh, uh, might be using uh, our protocol and, and what uh, influence this uh, has on, on uh, further design decisions. So I, I would then encourage you to, to bring back your work uh, to us again. But um, as Dave said, um, it really would be good to know what OPC uh, Foundation uh, thinks about this. And it also would be good to have some some numbers like like the uh, message sizes, the compression that, that uh, Dave talked about. Okay, thank you very much.
So we are 15 minutes uh, ahead of schedule and we're done with our agenda so we can have a brief open mic session and then go to early lunch. So is there anything that anybody wants to say at this point in time? Yes, um, Dave asked uh, who is going to be at the OCFW3C uh, T2TRG meeting on Friday. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, will it be, what about remote participation? Do you have that ability? Uh, I mean, on the mailing list on core, maybe you guys could send some information on how to join. Yeah, that has been sent to the research group mailing list and Bill just uh, said he might be yeah, uh, I also core. sent on the core mailing list the remote participation details. So they are oh. all uh, in the GitHub and core list and in the RG list. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Anything else? Then thank you and see you in Montreal. Or at the interim before that. <laughs> <clears throat> You're all right. Yeah, but the, the transport side was a bit too long. No, it was great. Yes, I'm waiting for them too. So it, it's, they are almost done, but uh, I was interrupted by the start of this meeting. Yeah, I guess. Could you send me a message, like a telegram message when you. Yes, Go away. Huh? Go away, do a bit. Okay. Say thank you. He's stressed. Yeah. Here's your chair. No, nothing. We just have to hopefully be a small, uh, solving issues.